there's that classic question about um, man having four wives and how he goes about treating them equally. Is that truly sustainable now in our modern? No, it's, not, it's I mean, it, one, it, uh, it, it is so, it is very important to, to first to note that most of the Sahaba, most of the companions, had one wife, lived and died with one wife. I mean, either or divorced or or she passed away and so on. Most of the companions did not have multiple wives. And the the, the Prophet ﷺ was an exceptional case because he married he was with one wife, Khadija, all the time in Mecca. And in Medina, all the marriages were what you could call humanitarian marriages. They all had a purpose and they all required a divine intervention. Like a lot of the biblical prophets, uh, uh, the, but the Quran is, is it, it, what it says about, it, it sets a limit, an outer limit of four, but it also says that if, if you feel you cannot be just, then one. And the language in Arabic clearly indicates a preference for one that you have. So, and it even says, وَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ أَنْ لَا تَقْسُطُوا الْيَتَامَى That if you fear that you will not be able to be equitable towards orphans, then you can have more than one wife. Well, who, who do you know where is more than one wife because of orphans, to take care of orphans? The Quran clearly says more than one wife if you want to take care of orphans. Now, of course, men interpreters interpreted this to say you can marry more than one wife, orphans or no orphans. But the Quran clearly says if you want to take care of orphans and you can have more than one wife, but even then you have to be just between them equally, but then it warns us that even if you try to be fair, you will not be able to be fair. Right? No, this is all in the Quran. This is not, it, it, it is the language of the Quran. Now, so I always tell men, well, do you have, are there orphans you want to take care of? That, so you need to marry more than one wife to take care of the orphans? I, I not once have I had a man tell me, oh, yes, there are orphans I want to take care of. <laughs> so the answer is, the, the one wife is the law. And one wife, it is what is healthy for the children and what was the Quran was talking about was polygamy is an, is an exceptional system of social welfare. I mean remember that at the time of the prophet the, the, because of the of the war with, with Mecca there were a lot of children who were orphaned and there is no social welfare system I mean, it, 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 children either belong to a family or they were at risk of becoming enslaved in, in uh, some raid or another. It, it, all of this is an important part of, and, and one of the things that I talk about in, in, the, in this eight-hour thing about Muslim women jurists is uh, uh, people forget that even... Uh, um, uh, Sakina, the, the, uh, or Sukaina, depending on how you pronounce it, the, the, the prophet's uh, granddaughter, the, the, I mean, sorry, the, uh, Imam Hussein's granddaughter, so the prophet's great granddaughter, um, set in her marital contract a condition that her husband not only cannot take a second wife, but that her husband cannot even take a slave girl. So basically, told him you can't buy slaves at a time that slavery is quite widespread. The first legal system to allow the wife to negotiate in her contract, limiting her husband to limiting her husband's sexuality to her own, to herself, is the Islamic legal system. And people again, and this was not an accident. This was the role of Muslim women interpreters because we forget that one of the 
One third of Islamic uh, jurisprudence came from Aisha, the Prophet's wife. And she played it in here and Fatima, and of course Fatima did not play uh, the Prophet, but, but Aisha and Umm Salama are the, the two main characters that played a huge role in, in early Islamic jurisprudence. And one of my big beefs with Wahhabi Islam is that it, it ignores a lot of these interpretations. It comes to Muslim women and, and basically uh, um, it gives them a, fair, a version that even is not consistent with what the Quran itself says about things. So it, it, is, it is not any man that comes and says, it is my right to take a second wife or a third. It's not true. It's not, it, it, is, it, it is not their, their, their God-given right. Who says? And I uh, believe as a new Muslim, a lot of women um, have been put in that situation. I've known of a woman before who was a convert, and she came to me and asked me, did I know of a woman who was seeking to marry because his, um, her husband was seeking a second wife? And it just didn't sound right. And, and the coming from a woman... I, you know, it, it, is, just, it is, it uh, is, the, the thing, again, when Islam is used to take away a human being's dignity, whether man or woman, it, it is contrary to what Islam is. So, you know, if a woman, I knew a woman who basically, uh, this is a woman in, in, around the uh, Palo Alto area, who, for whatever reason, she didn't want to... Uh, have sexual relations with her, with her husband, so they, she urged them to take a second wife. And they came and asked me, and I said, you know, that's, that's your business. Because, I mean, if, if, but a situation where a woman comes and says, uh, you know, I actually don't want my husband to take a second wife, but he tells me that it's his, his God-given right, mm -hmm. then here, I must correct that information. It's not God-given right. It, and in, in fact, the only part of the Quran that talks about it is limiting it to, it to four, and it it conditions it, what we call illat al or the operative cause, it conditions it on the issue of orphans, which even if you interpret beyond orphans, then you say in exceptional circumstance according to need. But it, it, it is not the way contemporary Muslims try to practice. I, in the modern age, children, what life experiences have taught me is that children of, of polygamy in the modern age come out not right. I mean, they come out with, with a bruising experience. And the, the, it is, we have to teach our children dignity, because that's what Islam teaches them. And a, a woman that doesn't feel dignified cannot teach children dignity. I mean, my, my, my mother was, was a, I learned my sense of dignity and sense of honor from my mother. And she was a, you know, a very dignified human being. and and. I've noticed that women, people who don't have a strong mother figure, they, they, they themselves come out weak in, in their sense of Islam, their sense of what Islam gives them as a matter of right. And, and, I, and, I, and I'll tell you, there's a hadith from, uh, uh, from the Prophet that the, the, whether the ummah is healthy or not depends on whether the, the, the victory of an of a, of a ummah comes from its women. And I, and I truly believe that. Mm -hmm. if, if we have strong women, we will be strong as Muslims. If we have weak and broken women, we will be weak. And, and I think sociology and modern sociology and anthropology bears that. I mean, it's, it's quite remarkable. Quick question. Um, now we're talking about how it, um, um, 
if a man decides to marry and have a second wife, does the first one have the right to know before he decides to do it? In, in, in Wahhabi Islam, no. No. Because in Wahhabi Islam, mm -hmm. in, 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 in the interpretations of so many Muslim jurists through history, she has a right to know, and she also has a right to divorce if she doesn't agree. So, the, you know, this thing of marrying behind your wife's back, that's lying and cheating, and the Quran prohibits lying and cheating in, I mean, what is one of the biggest sins? Lying, cheating, you can't lie, and you can't cheat. And people forget that if you marry and you don't tell your wife, that's lying and cheating. How can lying be halal? So, I mean, that's one of the things that drives me crazy about Wahhabi Islam. How, I mean, the Quran is so... It emphasizes the, si the sin of lying more than and it emphasizes the sin of adultery, more than it emphasizes the sin of drinking, more than it emphasizes... Maybe the only exception is killing. Lying is one of the biggest sins. So, how can... And not... And, and what's what very interesting is that and this comes from Aisha, uh, that failure to disclose when there is an obligation to disclose, Aisha tells us is lying. So just keeping it secret when there is... You, you, normal people would say, no, you can't keep it a secret. Aisha tells us is lying. So that closes the circle, and uh, I mean, I, I, I'm very sad when I sign, uh, because there are fatawa by uh, jurors, by these guys from Saudi Arabia that say, oh, you don't, you don't have to tell your wife and you can keep it a secret. How? How can you say it's halal, it's permissible to cheat? You can't. I mean, this is as, 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 as ridiculous as uh, when ISIS al Qaeda allow, allow people to kill innocent people. I mean. It just it completely it doesn't twist interpretation. It ignores what the Quran says altogether. And I always told some one final. I always told tell men uh, this. I told them, give me one example in which a companion married took his a, a, a second wife and kept it secret. <laughs> one is what one companion of all the companions that exist. I think that 